بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم السلام علیکم ٹوڈے آئی ہیو چوزن اے ویری امپورٹنٹ ٹاپک فرام دا میڈل ایئر اگین اینڈ دس از دا ایلمنٹ وچ کامنلی افیکٹس دی پیڈیاٹک ایج گروپس سو لیٹس ٹاک اباؤٹ دس از اے کائنڈ ٹائپ آف اوٹائٹس میڈیا اینڈ دس از کالڈ otitis media with effusion it is abbreviated as ome as well uh, there are different uh, names or terms which are used for this disease some people call it as serous otitis media others call it as secretory otitis media in layman term it is called as glue ear because they Uh, secretions are the fluid which is present in the middle ear cavity that is very thick just like a glue so that's why it is called as glue and uh, mind you this is non infective otitis media that there is no pus formation this is uh, the secretions are the discharge uh, the fluid which is present in the middle ear cavity that is non purulent so this is called as non infective otitis media and most commonly as i told you Uh, it is called as OME that is otitis media with effusion this is the chronic accumulation of mucus of course which is non purulent effusion within the middle ear cavity and in mastoid air cell systems and when we say this is chronic accumulation it means the duration of symptomatology should be at least more than 90 days it is usually preceded by an episode of acute otitis media that the, you can say that this is a sequelae of acute otitis media that uh, patient was having otalgia and fever and then treatment was given to the patient and the disease was at a pre suppurative stage and uh, constitutional symptoms they settled down but still that transudate remains accumulated there in the middle ear cavity so it is a sequelae of acute otitis media in such cases then inflammation of the eustachian tube epithelium due to any cause that is a you can say very important underlying uh, predisposing factor in the causation of otitis media with effusion flat cubital epithelium in these cases may be replaced by the thickened pseudo stratified mucus secreting epithelium goblet cells of course they are present and mucus secreting cells are formed so the effusion is a mixture of epithelial cells goblet cells mucus glands along with inflammatory transudate very viscous thick it is and due to the goblet cells and mucus glands so if you take this these secretions which are being removed from the medial cavity in a case of titus media with effusion these are so thick that they make a strand between two fingers eustachial tube dysfunction as i told you is a primarily a very important predisposing factor and uh, we know that in children the eustachial tube anatomically is different from the eustachian tube in adults and uh, children they are usually affected by the viral upper respiratory infections repeatedly so this disease is more prevalent in pediatric age groups then if the patient is allergic to some pollutants or milk or the baby is a passive smoker especially if mother is a smoker then they are predisposed to and if the baby is having gastroesophageal reflux disease then if congenitally they are having some craniofacial abnormalities like cleft palate in case of cleft palate you can very well imagine that during feeding the eustachial tube opening will be exposed to the uh, feed and uh, especially the milk which is a good source of uh, infection uh, this uh, for bacteria so then poor eustachial tube dysfunction or if the baby is having bifid uvula same is the case with the patients who are having uh, craniofacial abnormalities like down and tunnel syndromes these are the babies this is with the baby with down syndrome this is the baby with turner syndrome 
Eustachial tube dysfunction may be due to some mass present in the nasopharynx like uh, adenoids which are present during uh, early infancy and childhood. So if they become hypertrophic, mechanically they will be blocking or due to repeated infections, there may be edema of the eustachial tube opening in the nasopharynx. If someone is having nasopharyngeal carcinoma, uh, because they say that uh, if a Chinese come to you with a unilateral otitis media with a fusion and uh, with conductive type of hearing loss, must be suspicious of nasopharyngeal carcinoma. Palatal defects like cleft palate I just mentioned, barotrauma, hyperbaric oxygen therapy, edema during radiation therapy, especially in case of head and neck uh, tumor treatment, if they are being treated by radiation, uh, the eustachial tube dysfunction can occur leading to the otitis media with effusion. Then spread of infection maybe, as I told, just mentioned, it is a sequelae of acute otitis media. If it is not properly treated or unresolved acute otitis media, Chronic adenoids, chronic rhinosinusitis, chronic translitis, high prevalence is in HIV patients. Uh, bottle feeding is important predisposing factor, especially if the baby is being fed while lying flat. So the mothers should be instructed either to avoid bottle feeding or if it is uh, mandatory, then the head of the baby should be elevated at least so that the drops of milk should not go into the nasopharynx and swelling the eustachial tube opening. Gastroesophageal reflux disease, uh, it is common in children and pepsin has been found in the effusion from the middle ear. So still it can be an important predisposing factor and investigations are required to clarify this, their role in the causation of. So there is a bimodal presentation that uh, the child, usually pediatric age group and uh, early infancy that is one or two years of age and then when they go to school at four or five years of age peak incidence is around one year of age more common in winter because during winter upper respiratory tract infections are more common uh, respiratory tract infections ear infections they can lead to especially the acute otitis media at a pre-superative stage as a sequelae can cause otitis media with the fusion so to sum up you see it you malfunction due to any reason that uh, may be due to anatomical abnormalities like cleft palate down syndrome craniofacial abnormalities or if there is a mass there in the nasopharynx blocking the eustachial tube opening mechanically altered mucociliary system like infections in the nose paranasal sinuses post nasal space uh, upper respiratory tract infections then allergy surfactant deficiency ultrastructural changes on the cilia and nasopharyngeal disproportion in case of craniofacial abnormalities and adenoids especially. Adenoids, their role is recognized as a causative factor, main contributor to titus media with fusion. It is considered source of pathological bacteria that not only mechanically they can obstruct the orifice of the eustachian tube, but due to the repeated uh, infections of the adenoids, they can be a source of pathological bacteria causing the edema and inflammation of the eustachial tube opening leading to its blockage and then inflammatory mediators can release. So first episode is being seen in 50% of all children before the first birthday and 80% of all children before their third birthday. So 80% of the kids they have one episode at least of otitis media with a fusion before the age of three years. Prevalence is bimodal, that is at early infancy and then when they go to school, when children, uh, because there they are exposed to other kids of their same age group and again there are more attacks of upper respiratory tract infection. It is 1% at 11 years and above 15 years prevalence is just 0.6%. So prevalence high in younger children, 40% at 2 years, uncommon in teenagers, high in winter due to repeated infections of upper respiratory tract and in children with craniofacial abnormalities like in Down syndrome with allergy and those who are having passive smoking. Underlying eustachial tube function plays a leading role in the causation of this disease. 
uh, it ultimately leads to an inflammatory response in the middle ear mucosa and production of glue. Now, this is very important to understand that the function of the eustachian tube is uh, that uh, it uh, maintains the pressure of the air in the middle ear cavity. And middle ear cleft is exposed to the atmospheric air only through the nasopharyngeal end of the eustachian tube. Otherwise, middle ear cleft is a closed structure. And this eustachian tube is normally closed, especially its cartilaginous part. And it only opens periodically when we yawn, we swallow, or uh, we put some strain, or we try to blow our nose, etc. So, during that time, the air pressure is maintained on both sides of eustachian tube. If eustachian tube gets blocked due to any reason, what will happen? The air which is present in the middle ear cavity, gradually that will be absorbed and there will be a vacuum. And when there will be a vacuum, at that stage, the tympanic membrane will be retracted inwards. When I say inwards, it means towards the middle ear cavity. And when space is there, the lining mucoepithelium that try to occupy that vacuum or that space which is being created by the absorption of the air in the middle ear, secondary to eustachial tube dysfunction or eustachial tube blockage. So, mucoepithelium that takes that space and gradually there is engorgement of that lining epithelium leading to the secretion of the uh, glands, especially the mucus and serous glands. So, there will be formation of the fluid which is transudate and gradually this will start accumulating and as the volume of this fluid will be accumulating in the middle ear cavity, that tympanic membrane which is initially retracted inwards, now gradually it will be coming outwards and ultimately it will be bulging towards the external auditory canal. So, otoscopic findings will depend upon at which stage of justitial tube dysfunction the kid is being brought to you in the clinic. This glue which is being formed, it is thick, tenacious and mucus. It is rich in glyco and mucoproteins and it is containing inflammatory cells which will fill the middle ear. Spontaneous resolution is the rule rather than exception. In more than 90% of the cases, spontaneously resolution occurs but it is punctuated by remissions and relapses. Whenever there will be a respiratory tract infection, it may be followed by for the disease which is we are talking about, otitis media with fusion. In a small number of cases, persistent and severe cases, progressive atrophy and retraction of the tympanic membrane, and then the sequelae such as the retraction pockets and cholesteatoma may ultimately develop, but very rarely. In more than 80% of the cases, the complaint will be hearing loss. And this hearing loss because the kid will be very young. So, it is usually noticed by the parents, relatives or by the teachers in the class. Or it is picked up at routine school examination. Screening is done in European countries especially regularly. So, these kids are being picked up during those routine screening examinations. Hearing loss, of course, it will be persistent or it may be intermittent and it is of conductive type due to the presence of fluid in the middle ear. So, when hearing loss is there, naturally learning difficulties will be there. When learning difficulties will be there, that will lead to a delay in speech development and when there is delay in speech development, the kid will be very poor in academics. And uh, recurrent infections can be there. Otalgia is a very rare complaint, only in 1 to 2 percent of the cases. And those cases who will be associated with uh, adenoid hypertrophy, they will be having adenoid facies and complaints which are related with adenoid hypertrophy, like uh, mouth breathing, snoring, nasal obstruction, uh, extra. Most cases, they will present between 3 to 6 years of age. Examination may or may not reveal a middle ear effusion depending upon the activity of the process at consultation. So, autoscopic appearance may vary that the tympanic membrane may look dull red, grey or umber yellow. So, its color will be different. Tympanic membrane may be bulging outwards when fluid formation is there or it may be retracted inwards when it is at initial stage when just 
the eustachial tube blockage has occurred. There can be air bubbles with fluid levels in middle ear cavity. So depending upon the activity of the disease, the findings will be there. This is the otoscope. No ear examination is complete until and unless you examine it under magnification. This is a very handy tool to examine. Otherwise, if you are doubt, you can do the examination under microscope. And the here on the left side of the picture, this is a good otoscopy that how you have to hold this. This is just you have to hold it just like a pen, not like this on the right side. Still, you can see, but it is you are thrusting it in with force and you can see the expression of the patient. Patient is feeling pain. So this is not a good otoscopy. It should not be painful for the patient. This is pneumatic otoscopy. As you can see, there is a balloon and it is attached this with the tube there with this uh, otoscope. So when you will press this uh, balloon, the air will go and the pressure of the air in the external auditory canal will be raised. And if tympanic membrane is mobile, it will be pushed inwards. But in case of fluid, which is quite expected in otitis media with effusion, this tympanic membrane will not be pushed inwards because the fluid would not be compressed so easily. This is what we call as pneumatic otoscopy. So increasing the pressure in external auditory canal, we use Siegel speculum. Or if patient is elder and can understand, we can ask him to do the Valsalva maneuver. This is the increasing the pressure in the middle ear. How? And indirectly, we are checking the potency of the eustachian tube also that we simply ask the patient to close the nose and lips and then try to inflate the cheeks so that the air which is being expired that will go towards the nasopharynx when nose and nose, both nose and mouth is closed. It will go into the nasopharynx and through the eustachian tube, the pressure in the middle ear cavity will be raised and tympanic membrane will be pushed outwards. So, in case of uh, otitis media with effusion, depending upon the stage of the disease or activity of the disease, the tympanic membrane may still be mobile, partially mobile or it may be totally immobile. So, this is the normal tympanic membrane, you know, this is the handle of malleus, which is vertical. This is lateral process of malleus, anterior and posterior malleal folds and cone of light is there in the anterior inferior quadrant. So, in initial stages, when the eustachian tube will be having blockage or dysfunction, the air inside the middle ear cavity is absorbed and the tympanic membrane will be pushed inwards. That is retraction of the tympanic membrane. And when retraction of the tympanic membrane, what will happen? That this handle of malleus, which is longer and vertical, when it is retracted inwards, it becomes horizontal and looks shortened. This lateral process of malleus, which is not that much prominent, it becomes prominent once it is retracted inwards and similarly is the anterior and posterior malleolar folds, they become prominent and this cone of light, it is distorted, displaced or even it may be completely absent. So, if the handle of uh, this malleus, it is vertical, this is lateral process of malleus, if this handle of malleus is being pushed inwards, what will happen? When it is being pushed inwards, now it looks more horizontal and shortened and at the same time, this handle, this lateral process of malleus, it has become prominent. Similarly, the anterior and posterior malleolar folds will also become prominent along with the disappearance of the cone of light. So this is what we call as knuckle sign, just like a knuckle it becomes. So this is the knuckle sign is the sign of a retracted tympanic membrane. Audiogram. If it is feasible, because for audiogram, minimum age, uh, because this is a subjective test, so minimum age which is recommended is five years and above. And as we know that these children, they are usually younger, so it may not be feasible. But still, if it is appropriate age, so we can go for audiogram and it will show us a mild to moderate conductive type of hearing loss, which will be bilateral. So this is a pure tone audiogram of the left ear which is showing us a mild conductive type of hearing loss on the left side in this audiogram. Impedance audiometry, its sensitivity is more than 96% and it is an objective test so it can be done even in younger 
infants so what we expect is that when there will be fluid formation in the middle ear cavity it will be type b tympanogram which is typical of otitis media with the fusion and it differentiate it from the ustichial tube dysfunction and atosclerosis and when there will be only retraction or ustichial tube dysfunction then it will be type c tympanogram so this is a normal tympanogram here you can see the compliance is almost up to 1 and uh, it is maximum is at 0 0 means when air pressure is equal on both sides of the tympanic membrane that is in the middle ear cavity and in the external auditory canal in different diseases there can be different uh, scenarios so this is type a which is normal curve in autosclerosis it is type a s in uh, Ossicular chain discontinuity, it is a type A D curve, and this type C curve is in ustichial tube dysfunction, and this is the type B, which is a almost a flat curve in case of fluid there, which is present there in the titus media with a fusion. So, this is again a tympanogram type B curve, flat curve. There is no change, even the pressure in the external aortic canal is being changed from negative to positive, but the graph remains straight line. This is type B tympanogram in case of titus media with effusion. Nowadays, we can go for sonotubometry and acoustic reflectometry. And this sonotubometry is that a constant source of sound, 7 kilohertz at 100 decibel, is applied to the nostril while a microphone is placed in the external auditory canal and it records the transmitted and alternated sound pressure through the eustachian tube and middle ear and patient performs a specific maneuver like swallowing or yawning or valsalva. In the normal case of eustachian tube opening, a significant increase in sound level will be registered in the external auditory canal. In acoustic reflectometry, uh, we use an acoustic otoscope to measure the reflected sound from the tympanic membrane. The louder the reflected sound, the greater the likelihood of an middle ear effusion. The breakpoint is defined as the level of sound reflectivity that correlates with the presence of middle ear effusion. So, sonotobometry, as you can see, that the, we need the co cooperation of the patient as the patient has to do swallow, yawning, valsalva. So, it is not applicable for kids. If we are suspecting from history and clinical examination and we have to rule out the adenoid hypertrophy, we will request for the X-ray nasopharynx lateral view which will show us if adenoids are hypertrophied or not. In X-ray mastoid Schuller's view, there may be clouding of the mastoid air cell system because the fluid which is occupying in the middle ear cavity not only confined to middle ear cavity but it will it will be involving the uh, mastoid air cell systems also and MRI will uh, uh, show us absence of fluid in middle ear otitis media with fusion or not but still in one third of the patients in MRI study there may be fluid in the mastoid but not in the mesotympanum. So this is X-ray nasopharynx lateral view and then circle with this red line you can see this is the air column if you are tracing it from down upwards just in front of C1 you can see a soft tissue shadow which is being marked by this white arrow and it is compressing the air column. So most probably this is the adenoid hypertrophy. So with that we come to end of this session and we will continue in part 2 the treatment of this disease. If you have any queries you can post it in comment section. Thanks for watching.